Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we create a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems? And I'm in conversation with Miranda Wolpert. So I'm Miranda Wolpert and I'm Director of Mental Health at the Wellcome Trust. And the Wellcome Trust is a big uh, research funder, science research funder and um, uh, mental health is an increasing part of what we fund and uh, uh, look to uh, enhance. And the question that we've got as our kind of episode title today is um, how can we create a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems? And I wondered if we could leap in by starting. Why was that the question you are interested to answer? So that's the mission we've set ourselves at Welcome to try and use our funding to try and create that world. And uh, it took some time when I, I first came into post, um, slightly different posts as we were just discussing uh, about a year and a half ago, um, and uh, to try and think about what was the impact the Welcome could make in terms of science funding that would really make a difference for mental health. And one of the first things I did was did a blog around, should we be trying to find a way to cure mental health problems? Should we be trying to find a way to help people manage with ongoing difficulties? And what emerged from that, from discussions with the sort of wider community is that there's a real range. So for some people, they have a problem, it goes away, it never comes back again. For other people, they are living with problems their whole life that they are managing and dealing with. And that actually trying to find a language that talked about the fact of that, that, that we don't yet know what's acute and what's chronic in terms of mental health problems. Uh, that needs to be recognised. So we came up with this phrase, no one held back by, because we thought actually at heart, what we're trying to do is make people, what we want is science that helps people live their lives to their best and their their fullest, and to be able to flourish and flower, whether they have an ongoing mental health problem or whether they don't. So that's the ambition. And that's what we, so that's what I'm interested in sort of talking about and thinking about. Wow. So that's that's quite a big, uh, a big, big job, no? (laughs) Yes, it is. And what are the things that kind of, you know, obviously when we come up with a mission, that's because we think this isn't working right now. What is not working there? What are we getting wrong at the moment or what is holding people back? So I think uh, our view at Welcome is that um, we don't yet have as good a handle as we need on what works for whom and why. And that um, the field of mental health science has been under-resourced and that people have, there have been passionate, fantastic scientists and researchers who've done their their work, but they've rather plowed their own furrows Mm -hmm. and they haven't necessarily come together in an integrated group as yet. And one of the agendas is, can we pull together the fantastic work that's been doing so it's it's a bit more integrated and we have a bit more of a a concerted understanding. Uh, I think one of the things that's held us back as a scientific community is that, that, that people have got caught in fights between, for example, is mental health caused by a biological problem? Is it fundamentally a biological problem? Or is it fundamentally a social problem? And that's been seen as if they, those two are mutually exclusive and people have sort of gone to war with each other over that. And, and also people have been very focused on saying, the only way to help people not be held back is to understand what causes mental health problems. And while that's a very understandable perspective, and it is obviously important to try and understand what causes problems, there's been this sort of um, working belief or core belief or assumption that we can only help people if we understand cause. And then you get into this debate about, well, is it biological or is it social? Mm. Whereas actually what we're trying to say is, why don't we put those debates about cause sort of to one side for the moment and think rather about what helps people. So whether it's caused by biological or social factors, The solutions may be a mixture of biological or social or all sorts of other things. So it's trying to think from the solution end about what's what can really help people live their lives. So that sounds like a really like we're working at completely different levels, but with a similar approach, I guess. So when I'm talking to a room full of teaching assistants and I'm saying it doesn't matter if you're seeing this distress because the child is depressed or anxious or they've experienced trauma. What matters is that they're distressed and here's what we might do to help. And you're kind of doing that on a big. Uh... I think that's exactly right. And and. In a way, I think we're, we're, where we have a shared agenda is also trying to help people find what works for them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that what seems to be emerging from the science is that it's very individual. Yeah. 
So there isn't going to be a one size fits all for people. We aren't going to find this wonderful evidence based X that if everyone does it, everyone's better. We might find something that a lot of people help or helps a lot of people. Um, but even then, it's going to, it, it seems what seems to be emerging from what we are finding so far is that it may be about helping people navigate and find out what works for them, which may be different at different times of their life and maybe different in different contexts. That's that's really interesting and a bit different than perhaps what we might have thought we were hoping to do a few years ago. So yes, it's, certainly it's been a change for me in terms of my thinking on this, and that may change again. We may then discover actually there is this wonderful evidence-based thing, and that that's all we need, and we just need to roll it out. But it, it isn't clear to me that there, there are some that are like that. So, for example, if if you've got a child that is um, phobic of something there are very clear interventions yeah. you know around exposure and response prevention about helping people face that fear in a very contained way that yeah. really work and that are quite straightforward they need skill and expertise to do them but that, that can be done if we can roll those out we can really change many people's lives mm -hmm. but there are other things that people experience um particularly for example depression where there's a range of ways through that people find and mm -hmm. there doesn't seem to be a one silver bullet that works for everyone yeah. So I'm going to dig into that a little bit more in a moment. But just before we go deeper, I think it's important to take a step outward and just just explain just a little bit more about um, what the Welcome Trust is and in terms of the national and international agenda there, because maybe not everyone listening in will have, have come across. Absolutely. I wouldn't expect most of them to have. Mm -hmm. So uh, Welcome is spelt. It, it, it is a very welcoming place, but it is actually spelt with two L's. And it's named after this rather extraordinary pioneer called Sir Henry Wellcome, who made his fortune in pharmaceuticals, um, but also was an amazing collector, went around the world collecting anything to do with med medicine and science. So when he uh, died, he left in his will his money in trust. And at that stage, it was linked to the pharmaceutical company. In more recent years, we're completely separate. We're an independent foundation. We don't have a living founder. Um, and our remit is to... Um, deal with the most urgent health challenges and to really try and find ways forward using science. We now, our funding now comes from the money that he left has been now invested. We have an investment team um, that runs our investment portfolio. So all the money that we get to use is based on those investments. Wow. We have about a billion pounds a year to give away. So it's, a, it's not a small endeavor, this it's a big endeavor. Um, and we're either the second or the third biggest science funder in the world, depending on how you look at it. Um, and uh, traditionally, I think we were seen as very much uh, biomedical and uh, giving uh, 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 funding to uh, fantastic science at the sort of biological level. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly we're seen as we do that and we continue to do that. And we're very proud of that. But we also do, uh, we have now encompassed science in a much wider view. So anything, anything that's a rigorous uh, addition to understanding what helps people and why in terms of the big health challenges that we've taken on, we're interested in, right through from the sort of basic discovery science of sort of looking at anything in the world and trying to understand how the world works, right through to much more targeted funding about will this work for this group in this context. So it's quite unusual uh, to be speaking to someone working within the field of mental health who says, I've got a decent budget. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's been a real shock to me. <laughs> um, having come from working in academia and in the voluntary sector, so it's new to me. And I am, uh, and and what's even lovely is, is my budget is all to give away. So my role is simply is to try and fund and fuel fantastic science that's going to really make a difference in terms of people's lives. And also to say that the other part of the Welcome Foundation, which is really exciting, is again consistent with Sir Henry Welcome's um, traditions. We have a museum, we have a cultural arm. And we have a policy arm. So we, ha we are also interested in how, not just in the pure science, but how do we get that science out there? How do we communicate mm. it? How do we learn from the arts? How do we engage with people with lived experience, mental health issues to really inform the agenda? So it's quite a sort of, um, it is at its heart, a very multidisciplinary agenda that we're trying to uh, develop. And how do you choose what to do then with your time, with your effort, with your budget? Because, you know, that, that mission that you've suggested is, huge and very exciting but how, how do you prioritize within that yeah that's a great question uh, we spend a lot of time agonizing about how to do that in a fair and transparent way mm -hmm. um, so when I came into role there'd already been about two years of work 
uh, within the trust, working with, uh, consulting with a whole range of colleagues around where were the big issues. And that's where the idea came that the field was fragmented and needed to be brought together. The agreement was made at that stage to focus particularly on anxiety and depression and on young people as one sort of lens in mm -hmm. and to make sure that we were thinking globally, not just beyond uh, sort of what we're calling the weird countries, the Western industrialized, educated, rich and developed, mm -hmm. but actually moving beyond that to low middle income context, to low resource context, to really be thinking about what works for a whole range of, of global populations. So we have a process within the trust where we have external advisors, we have internal advisors, and we have a board that finally signs off on our strategic direction. So my first six months in post were refining that strategy, taking it to the board, agreeing it, and then that's now been published on our website. So anyone who wants to look at that strategy can see it, can see how we've decided on where we will focus for the moment. As we move now into a broader challenge area in mental health, we will move beyond anxiety and depression to encompass things like um, psychosis, which we are already doing in other parts of the trust. We have psychosis flagships looking at uh, early intervention psychosis, but also looking at neurodevelopmental issues um, and more fundamental sort of uh, neurology, which is, sits within our discovery funding streams. Wow. And have you had to radically revise any of your direction based on the, the current circumstances? I've certainly been hearing lots around sort of mental health linked to the pandemic. So we, we had a very hard think about that. And I published a blog on it that people may be interested to have a look at, it's quite short, where we were really making the argument that, that many funders had sort of completely pivoted and said, you know, we're only going to focus on COVID related work. Mm -hmm. Welcome did do some very specific COVID work and Welcome's been very involved in vaccine development uh, as part of our infectious diseases work. So we've made involved at that end. And we had to make a decision about mental health of how much we, it meant stopping what we were doing and how much it meant continuing what we were doing. And I think our fundamental, so there were, there were some COVID specific things we did, which I can talk about, but our fundamental contention was that COVID shone a spotlight on an existing mental mm -hmm. health crisis. It didn't, create, it didn't create new mental health problems no one had ever heard of. It actually shone a spotlight on something that we already knew. So actually progressing with trying to find next generation treatments for anxiety and depression for young people was mm -hmm. spot on. And we need to do that faster and harder. We didn't need to sort of change. We did commission uh, two bits of specific work around COVID. One was that we funded Daisy Fancourt to, um, at UCL, who was convening work around uh, surveys around the impact of COVID and convening that at a global scale, something called the COVID Minds Network. And that's worked brilliantly in that she's now producing reports about what we're learning from across the world. Mm. One of our worries was that there were lots of these surveys set up and that we were going to end up with a million different surveys of variable quality um, and all basically saying, oh, look, people are, are anxious and depressed, which we sort of, some of which we knew. But yeah. so some of these surveys, but, now, but what's brilliant is now by bringing it together and really learning who it's affecting in what ways, how it interacts with loneliness, how it interacts with what people can actually do, how it interacts with self-care, that's really helpful to us. The second piece of work we did was a sort of cultural engagement of trying to understand how people managed during lockdown and how people were coping and trying to think about what we could learn from this moment of crisis that we could take forward into the new world. So we developed something called COVID Living and something called Collective Resilience, where we commissioned cultural groups to look at those issues. And again, that's on our website and people can see what we've done in relation to that. What that's led to then is an engagement with some, some big global organisations, the World Health Organisation, the World Economic Forum and UNICEF. And we've committed with them to work with a group of young people with lived experience mental health problems to say how we're embedding three key principles in our work going forward. One is how we embed lived experience in everything we do and make sure that those who have the most deep experience really inform what we're doing. The second is we look at local innovation to really understand what works in a particular locality. And the third is that we always look larger than healthcare, that we, we recognize that mental health it's really a, an issue that has implications for all sorts of policy agendas, not just healthcare. I'm particularly interested to pick up, uh, as I would be personal bias, but why um, that, you know, number one priority you named there was about lived experience kind of working through all of your work. What's the, the kind of thinking behind that? I think the thinking behind that is that it's, you wouldn't, build or design anything without building without bringing in experts who really understand who you're building it for mm -hmm. so part of it is about that we just need the expertise of people who this who were doing this for and if you don't have the expertise you can go completely awry and think you're getting something really right that's completely wrong mm -hmm. 
The second, I think, thing is that that up till now, where we haven't had those voices, there have been all sorts of assumptions and, and ideas around what lived experience looks like and what the variety of it is. And that, I think, made, made us rather more limited in what we understand by what it is to feel, to have depression, to have anxiety, to have trauma. So we need a variety of experience to really inform us so that we can, we can make the best science possible. And that, that those, that people with lived experience bring particular expertise that when brought together with other areas of expertise can, can lead to new insights. And I, I think, yeah, I, I suppose that's it. I, 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 yeah, on a personal level, obviously, I think that's really important. And it's something I've always worked hard to, to bring to my work. But I think it is always important to think about at what point does lived and living experience, uh, you know, what, at what point do we need to then hand over to the people who've got the academic expertise and, 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 and so on and so forth. But um, I, I think that's a really important point. So I think it's really important that no one expertise trumps another. So it isn't that, you know, oh, well, you're the ad- academic, so I defer to you on everything. You defer, I defer to you on the things that you are expert on, yeah. but on other things, so that, the, and it is about a give, so it does require a lot of give and take from people, and it requires everyone who's involved to be open-minded and respectful of other people's expertise. Yes. Um, because I could think there can be, you can go the other way and end up den- not really recognising the academic expertise or the research expertise, which is also complex and uh, uh, there are different perspectives on that as well. So even within the academic field, it's important that expertise from different domains is also seen as having equivalent status and people defer when 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 they're working in someone else's domain. Yeah, because it's always been uh, one of my personal frustrations when people weight my living experience of mental health issues as more credible than the many, many years of, of research and training um, that I, I have. And actually, I think um, both both are important and and certainly, you know, a, a kind of big personal thank you to you really for uh, supporting me in my personal journey there. Because I do remember, you know, when I was very, very ill, feeling very ashamed, actually, and thinking, how can I possibly purport to be an expert? and how can I remain credible when I'm in hospital and my life is in the balance um, and I'm not able to to manage and I remember you saying you know that will make you more credible um, but you've got to get through and and you know uh, yeah so thank you um yeah oh it just takes me back to a very difficult time and uh, yes so um, well, I mean I wanted just to say thank you to you because I think you do you have done so much to change those perceptions and to hold in balance both being a professional expert and bringing lived experience and being clear that those are different expertises, that, but, but they're both informed by each other. So I think, you know, I, I think you've taught all of us a lot around that. So you know, thank you. Oh, no, thank, no, thank you. And it's, that's the thing. And it is, it is hard. And it's one of the things I have to hold myself uh, to account for often, because actually, you know, exactly as you talked about right from the beginning, this is about learning to live well, in spite of, of ongoing challenges. Um, and um, I find that sometimes I have to be careful, because we're all telling a story all the time. And sometimes I work really hard to be positive and proactive and productive. And people don't always see the days when it's really hard. And I have to check in sometimes and share that on Honestly, because I think that one of the issues I find sometimes, and this is why I th- find things like um, eating disorders awareness week particularly hard, you see lots of people who seem to be managing perfectly. And I think it's important that we know that, you know what, there are hard days too, and perhaps these are the way that we, we get through those. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge. probably worth mentioning in relation to that, there were two things I wanted to sort of plug while I was on your podcast. Yes. One, one is that we have um, a welcome photography prize. Yeah. which is open each year to anyone. You don't have to be a professional photographer at all. I think the closing date is, if I remember it right, the 18th of January. Um, and uh, that really is about people finding more nuanced ways of representing what it is to have a mental health problem and what it is to recover from a mental health problem. So it just really reminds me when you were talking just now, you know, anyone that's got a vision of how they'd like to present that, either about themselves or other people, please put in a, 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 an application. It's quite a simple a way of doing it and certainly last year we had some amazing um sort of ways of people representing that uh, that trajectory which is for most people is up and down for many people it's fluctuating so that was one and then the second one was that uh, the um i um have the privilege of being a, a a judge on the all in the mind 
uh, mental health awards and that closes at the end of January and there people have a chance to nominate someone that's really helped them with their mental health journey so we can put both those details on your uh, show notes but just be really good to encourage people to make use of these these two prizes. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? So first of all, maybe why Welcome sponsors the the photography prize and what you kind of hope to get from it and maybe what you've seen in the past that's inspiring there. So I think it's part of this this mission from Welcome to, to bring together cultural engagement with policy, with hard science, with lived experience. Um, so uh, the, the photography prize really is a way of trying to bring a different language and and open new debates and discussions around some of these health challenges mm -hmm. and it really brings a different it allows you to have a different sort of conversation and to present things different ways so you know when you write something or even talk about it mm -hmm. you are limited by those sort of structures whereas when you present it visually it can it lead to all sorts of different emotions so exactly as you're saying one of the things last year's photography prize and i'm going to uh, forget at this moment the name of the winner in fact the overall winner from the photography prize was a mental health um a series of mental health photos and it was fantastic photos of this uh, the photographer's journey through his own mental health issues and they were both witty but deeply sad but also deeply strong all at the same time and I suppose that exactly what you're saying that that, that can be conveyed in a way that a post on twitter that says I'm great now or mm -hmm. I'm sad that doesn't quite get so the sort of nuance of all that complexity can be got. So I would encourage people to look at it. And again, we can put links on your show notes to people. So, you know, there's a picture of him, for example, with a sort of a, a dead Christmas tree in his parents' basement. Um, mm. And just, you know, and, and he's reflecting on both the sadness and the hope for the year to come. Wow. So I think there's some very, you know, so it's very powerful. And then another uh, prize winner was um, a photographer, who'd, uh, a Russian photographer, who'd photographed um, friends and colleagues and th their sort of toolkits of what got them through their mental health issues, which ranged from poetry to pills. So, mm -hmm. and, and what they had is they had sort of images of themselves and then images of these things that were their sort of lifeline. So I think one person was a cold water swimmer, which always resonates with me. There was, an, <laughs> but there was also, um, you know, therapy, poetry, friends, games. And I think, again, it helped. And I think seeing it visually, again, bring, makes it feel much more real and, and allows you to relate to it more emotionally than having a list of those things in a sort of written format. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and as you say, there is something just really powerful about the, the different arts. As you know, I'm a big fan of using poetry. And the thing I found with poetry is um, it doesn't need to be good um, to provoke a thought, a feeling, a conversation and um, can be quite cathartic as well. And somehow it's a lot more freeing than um, yeah other forms of writing. Uh, I, I think that's right. And I think for mental health in particular, where we're still really feeling our way to try and understand what is this what is this? What is it? Mm -hmm. And trying to convey to each other very personal things, mm -hmm. trying to get that mix. Um, and I guess that's, that's another reason why I think having lived experience of part of the scientific community is so important, because otherwise there can be this sort of othering. Like, you know, and, and I suppose um, those of us who know, who work in mental health feel there is no them and us. You know, everyone has mental health. Different people have different, different, different times, just as everyone has physical health. Yeah. So the fact you've got a cold today or not tomorrow doesn't make you a better or worse person or a different sort of being. And in a way, the more we can sort of build that in and know that, you know, people, uh, researchers might talk about their own personal experiences and not identify someone with lived experience of mental health problems. Someone yeah. with mental health problems may not choose to talk about their lived experience at all, but may draw on that in thinking about how they want things shaped. So that people, I, I suppose I feel very passionate. No one should feel any pressure to tell a personal story they don't want to mm. but we should also feel comfortable that anyone can tell a personal story without feeling they're going to be judged for it in any way if it feels apposite or useful for other people to hear. I think that's that's so important and it is one of the things that people often ask me um, about because I've been fortunate in that because I've always worked kind of relatively independently I've been able to share my own story and carve my own way but many people don't have that privilege do they many people do feel that they will be judged by uh, colleagues or employers and that that is a much harder thing to be open and honest about um, and I guess we would hope for a future where that wasn't the case. Um, Absolutely. 
And then tell me about the uh, All in the Mind uh, award. So, so All in the Mind is a Radio 4 programme run by Claudia Hammond, which does fantastic work in mental health and really raises the profile and looks at latest research findings. Uh, and she's been a sort of amazing advocate for mental health generally. Mm -hmm. um, and they run these awards. I'm not sure how many years they've won them. Uh, they've run them, but I certainly know it's been a number. And I've listened in in the past and they're brilliant. And they're really trying to celebrate uh, sort of individuals and organizations that have made a real difference in people's lives. So what you get to do is nominate someone. It can be an individual, it can be an organization. I'm hoping there might be a few scientists in there, who knows, um, <laughs> who, who have really made a difference for some for you when you were struggling or, or were in uh, distress. And it's a chance to celebrate those, those people in groups. And for both of those prizes, are they relatively easy to enter? Just wondering about in terms of people listening incredibly easy they and so again if we'll put the links on it's, it's yes. uh, literally you go on the website and you just plug in your entry amazing okay we'll make sure to include those so d diving a little bit more deeply into some of the work that you're doing at the moment I'm really keen to talk to you about the active ingredients work that you're doing a I just love all the visuals around it but maybe you can tell us a bit about that and where it's going and, and why why you're doing it fantastic I'm really pleased to hear that because we are really trying to think hard about the visuals so um I guess one of the one of the uh, things we thought about when we think think about what we're we trying to address here with this with our strategy was the fact that there are hundreds of different interventions for anxiety and depression, literally hundreds, and and with new ones being invented each day, and uh, people then become very passionate about about the thing they've invented and then people start sort of competing between their inventions and they're coming from a good place everyone wants to help these are really passionate caring uh advocates but it becomes then quite hard to find a sort of neutral science within that mm. so uh, and and also there the, these interventions are often quite complex and multi dimensional so it's often like you know do lots of this and then lots of that and you've got to be trained for 10 years to have done that yeah. and so it's quite hard to know well what are the core components what are the things that really make a difference within sort of intervention x or intervention y so we start out with this ambition to say well can we tease them apart we know that it's all going to be very complicated there isn't going to be one magic building block that you know you just take this pill and it's all going to be okay but can we try and pull apart these things like try and get them down to their building blocks so we can then test and do science on the different building blocks before we build them up again so that we can try and find out what's the most sort of parsimonious, what's the simplest thing that we could do, what's the cheapest thing we could do, what's the easiest thing we could do that will really help the most people. Yeah. So um, to do that, we, we launched a commission where we said, okay, scientists out there and anyone, tell us what your best bets are for what you think is the one core component the one active ingredient if you had to make a bet you would say this is the thing I would really study and, and work on mm. and we commissioned we, and we had loads of people bring in their ideas and from those we chose 30 teams around the world to look at 26 active ingredients not a comprehensive list we recognize that we could have probably done another 100 and in fact we will have a second call out coming out later this early well early this year but in a month or so's time to fill it, plug in some of the gaps but the idea was to try and look at a, a range of things, really as exemplars of how we might look at active ingredients, looking at the evidence that already existed, not doing fresh research, just looking at what does the evidence already say. And we wanted them to range the full span from the cellular to the societal. So we ended up with looking at active ingredients that range from things like changing brain chemistry to uh, the microbiome of the gut, to sleep patterns, right through to what about if you just give people money? cash transfers what about neighborhood social cohesion and 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 in between all the sort of uh, behavioral and cognitive things like changing how people think about themselves what about levels of self-compassion what about uh, levels of physical activity what about um how people uh do pleasurable things each day to try and stimulate themselves what about engagement with the art so full range of things all of that's on our website anyone can have a look at it and we ended up with these fantastic reports. Again, we've got a little summary of each one on the website that talk about uh, which ones work for which people okay. and, in, and trying to understand in what ways. And as you say, we've now tried to sort of 
create a sort of visual metaphor for that, which we, which we develop with people with lived experience. So we have youth advisors from around the world who work with us, who help us think these things through. And they came up with this, you know, is it a bit like cooking? Is it a bit like finding the right ingredients that work for me? What can be in my store cupboard? And one of the things we wanted to do is say that store cupboard might include things that only a professional can prescribe. So they might include sort of antidepressants, but it might also include things that you can prescribe for yourself. Like today's a TV watching day and that's what's going to help me. So it's trying to find the range of ingredients and then trying to think, how can we put those ingredients together in what order and which ones are core for whom? And are any of those ingredients harmful? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we must make sure that we're not prescribing um, harmful ingredients for people. And then our idea is then to do research about those ingredients so we can really understand them and how they work and for whom and in what context. I'm interested about that idea there of avoiding harm, just because one of the um, things that kind of comes to mind is is running. You know, it's it's uh, January at the moment, and lots of people are doing run every day, and I love running but I can't do it because I can't do it safely so part of my kind of eating disorder history means that I used to literally run until I would collapse and I can't run without competing against myself and I've tried really hard but for me it's like a drug and so I do other things instead I climb because you can't over climb in the same way that you can overrun but um it, it does make me wonder because something like running say would for most people be I think a really positive and easy to access you can even do it during full lockdown down um but for some harmful so how do you differentiate there because what might be good for some may be harmful for others and I, I think this links to the personalization point that i think with mental health in particular what may be fantastic help exactly as you say what may be fantastic help for someone may be completely harmful for someone else mm. and so what i think is increasingly um coming to the fore as a research agenda is how do we help people make those choices? So yeah. how do we help people learn that for them running is not going to work or that it is going to work or find a way to, to have it work? It isn't going to be about just saying to everyone, run, that works. <laughs> so, so I think it is about how do we help people find the right door for them yeah. and know that particularly, well, for where we are currently with current evidence mental health, it may mean trying a few doors yeah. before you find the one that's right for you. And it may be right for you at one stage in your life and then not right for you at another stage in your life. Yeah. So I think it is exactly that. It's about knowing that this might be, have to be individual experiments of, of one for some people. Uh, we may know some things are, are overall harmful and some things are overall helpful. But I think it is, it is, an, it is an area where personalization and what's right for an individual is crucial. So mm -hmm. one of the things we, we have commissioned is we're looking at creating um, a global data bank, which is where, uh, where we want large numbers of individuals to kindly share their daily activities and their experiences to try and track what works for them over time for exactly these sorts of reasons so that we can try and see for these sort of people for this sort of group this might work mm. but for this sort of group this might not work and that that gets shared as a sort of community so that people learn and one of the things we're trying to experiment with that is can we set that up in such a way that the people who are banking their data have maximum control and input into the science so it isn't again them and us, they become citizen scientists in their own lives. So we're working with a, um, a fantastic company called Sage Bio Networks in the States. We've convened a collaboration across the UK, uh, India and South Africa. And we're just testing out to proof of concept to see if we can get this to work. Wow, that sounds really exciting. And that would presumably that also speaks to this idea of trying to kind of close the gap between research and practice, because it would be very much kind of living data. Um, yeah. Wow. And as you have done this uh, piece of work, which it sounds like is, is very much ongoing, but has there been anything that's really surprised you? I think um, the individuality of it has, I think I went in still thinking, maybe there'll be some real front runs that will come up. Maybe there'll be, you know, from these 30, maybe three will come up that are like, these are absolutely you know, hitting the spot. And there are some, there are definitely some. So, you know, physical activity, um, behavioral activation, where you get people to be sort of positively orientated, sort of um, exposure for anxiety. The, you know, the, there are some dumps, there are some areas where we really know stuff and we could really say to most people, this is going to be really helpful. Yeah. But I suppose I've been surprised by how um, individual it seems to the, 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 it seems to be from the science so far and also the other thing that surprised me is particularly for the 14 to 24 year olds 
how little research has focused particularly on that age group, mm -hmm. that we've got lots on the sort of younger age group and lots on sort of working age, well, not lots, but more. Yeah. Um, but that age group in particular, we it, it, is, it often isn't um, designated in the literature in that way. So it's quite hard to find things that are specific to that age group. That's so I suppose that, that's been interesting. Because that's such a crucial moment as well when we're kind of, you know, growing into adults and it's a really difficult time. And we know that obviously in the current context right now, that's a particularly vulnerable group. They've lost a lot of their sense of purpose and belonging. And yeah, the world is hard for them and their, their prospects are perhaps a little poorer um, compared to other age groups. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So will that be a, a kind of particular area of focus for you then, that age group? Or? It, it is at the moment. So within the mental health priority area, the 14, 24 year olds is our, is our absolute focus. Okay. Not that we aren't interested in other age groups, but that's our focus. I think as we move into wider mental health challenge, we'll be looking at wider age groups. But at the moment, 14, 24 year old is a, is a key area of focus. Yeah. And it's interesting that idea that, yes, it's there aren't any kind of or very few sort of golden bullets. I find this that in my teaching, I always want to tell people, you know, the one thing you should do, although the one thing I do always say, I, I think I, I'm a, a bit of a broken record on it is sleep. Um, uh, you know, that if you want to do one thing to make people feel better, actually good and regular sleep, I, I think regardless of what the issues are, generally, um, that makes a big difference quite quickly. It is interesting, sleep was one of the active ingredients we looked at. Mm. Um, and Ian Hickey and his team uh, did a fantastic review looking at that. And there's some very interesting um, evidence about the links between sleep and mental health problems, exactly mm. as you say, and a, a really interesting emerging field. I think what we were, are lacking so far yet is the research that shows how best to intervene to help with that. Yes. And I guess that, that's, that's the bit that we still need to really crack. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, there's a couple of different things there, aren't there? I mean, certainly I started engaging more with sleep um, and, and thinking about it. Actually, I think it was you that gave me Arianna Huffington's uh, Thrive, um, and she talked about sleep and how it made a big difference in her life. And I think it was one of those where you thought, well, if she can make it a priority, I ought to at least give it a try. And, and for me, kind of sleep deprivation had been, I think, a form of self-harm perhaps in the past. But um, I found it made a big difference. And I think when you really believe in something personally and you've seen the impact, then you are more likely to advocate it. But one of the issues I come across um, is that largely people get it and they have seen that in their own life and they can see it would make a difference and they're happy to give it a try. But for some people where there is some sort of disorder or difficulty around sleep, being told, do you know what, getting a bit more regular good sleep will really help you. Sometimes that can actually make things worse because it makes them worry then. Well, I'm not getting enough sleep and I can't get to sleep. And yeah, that can make it hard. I think that's right. And I think it goes back to what we're talking about, the personalisation. You know, it is about trying to find what's right for the individual and also for the stage. So there's some interesting research about people with ongoing and very severe and enduring depression that actually uh, have uh, sleeping less can be helpful and having sort of so there are all a whole sort of interventions about sleeping less so there there are um i think i think helping people find what works for them at that stage and sort of opening that as, as an issue and then seeing if there are ways into it uh, so one of the things i suppose that's that's really given me pause for thought about the active ingredients is we don't know what it's it, it may be each person has to work out an individual chain of how things will affect them yeah. so it may be that for someone that the way of addressing their sleep may be by addressing something else will help them sleep yeah. whereas for someone else by helping them sleep it will address something else yeah and, yeah. and it's quite hard there's a lot of of um trying to work out which thing which, which way to go in in yeah. i think in the active ingredients uh Feel that we need to sort of try and find a way to disentangle and within your work or within the wider work of welcome do you look at the kind of the the links between physical and mental health because that picture feels like it's getting more and more blurry all the time um everything I thought I once knew about those interactions I feel I don't really anymore <laughs> I, I think that's a really important area and a really growing area and I think there will be all sorts of opportunities for learning um learning going forward yeah. And why are you doing this? Like what, you know, I, I've known you for years and you've been such an important advocate and voice um, within the, the, the field of mental health and you, you've had such an impact. But why did you start within that field and, and what, you know, what inspires you to continue? 
So it's something I've always been interested in, and I'm sure one could dig into my family history to try and work out why. Mm -hmm. But certainly from childhood, I've always been interested in trying to understand uh, how what motivates people and how to help people with mental health difficulties. Um, I guess to such an extent, I can't really understand why everyone else isn't completely fascinated by it too. I don't really understand why, you know, really don't really believe that everyone else isn't secretly fascinated too. Um, and I guess what sort of fueled me throughout my career, and I suppose having started as a clinician and then moved into more research and policy and now into funding, is this sense that it is such a, a mystery and one that it's so, if you don't, if you can get the right voices involved, we can find some creative solutions. Yeah. But that if you end up sort of trying to sort of battle it out by yourself or sort of think there's one easy solution, it yeah. can end up with so many dead ends that are really unhelpful and potentially harmful to people. So I suppose I feel a bit in a mission to try and bring those brilliantly rich voices together to find creative solutions. And I suppose going back to those 14, 24 year olds we were talking about earlier, one of the things that's really struck me working with some of the youth advocates there are some really exciting new ideas emerging, both from older, you know, even over 50 uh, researchers. No <laughs> yeah, but, but also from those youth advocates. And if we can bring those energies together, we're at, you know, mental health science is at the cusp of actually being unbelievably exciting. I listened to a program on radio. I'm a bit of a Radio 4 addict. And, and there was a program with Adam Rutherford looking at the, all the best uh, findings of science of the last 10 years. And mental health didn't come on the radar. And my mission is in 10 years time, 2030, I want there to be in such fantastic finds in mental health science that we are in such a different place for understanding some of these things. Wow. And, and how important is it that you, do you think that we are learning from our mistakes? Because I feel this is, as you say, it's, a, it's really a relatively young and emerging science. And we've got some stuff quite wrong in the past, haven't we? Um, and, and I don't mean like necessarily always in a big way. I think there are little things we're learning all the time where the new evidence says, oh, gosh, we should be doing this differently. So classic example would be um, for me when working with young people who self-harm, we used to tell them to snap an elastic band on their wrist. And the latest evidence says, actually, that does more harm than good. Um, but... I'm not sure how good we are always at learning from those mistakes or publishing when we find out that, oh, we did this thing and it didn't work or it caused harm. So what are your, yeah. I completely agree. And I think, I think it's partly a function of having been a small and beleaguered field. People felt they had to advocate for what we did know and to sort of to, to give themselves, to give themselves understandably status with other disciplines mm. to say, well, you know, this is the way we do it. And also the field got very early defined by, different schools so you know when I was trained as a clinical psychologist we were trained in sort of CBT or psychodynamic therapy and you almost had to pick your mm. course whereas actually we should be we should just be interested in what works it doesn't really matter what it's called and it doesn't and we should be able to pick and choose from whatever is out there mm. and then and then when we find it doesn't work we should stop doing it and do something so it, I think part of it is creating a new identity where we see ourselves as mental health scientists and mental health practitioners and that we're not a CBT person or a psychodynamic person or a you know uh, an elastic band snapping person mm. and and uh, and I think that's partly the trajectory we've got to go on yeah so collaboration is going to be really really important it is and I think and I think remaining curious just remain like yeah you know, we are what reminding oneself that one's here in order to try and understand what works for whom and why and then to help so in order to do that, we need to learn from the latest findings and pull together uh, and synthesize from across the sort of the diverse fields that are currently a bit sort of um, almost sort of islanded. We need to sort of find bridges between those islands and then bring a, build, build a sort of meta community. And I will stop talking to you soon, I promise. I could talk to you for days. But one, one kind of final question before we maybe go into a closing thought. You talked about, you know, by 2030, you would love us to be able to look back and uh, see that some of the most exciting things that have happened in science that are happening within mental health. Wh what are you personally, like, really excited about when you look at that next decade in your career? If you were looking back, what do you hope will be different and that you, you might have played a part in there? So I guess there are three things at the moment that sort of link to my strategy. 
The first is that I would hope we would have a thriving mental health science community where people saw themselves as mental health scientists first and then neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists second, in a sense, and that, they, and that from that would have emerged some really exciting uh, new vocations, whether it's cannabidiols and psychosis or whether it's deep uh, brain stimulation for OCD or whether it's a personalized route through for anxiety and depression or whether it's you know do we just need to give money to communities and that makes all the difference mental health so and that those are all seen as scientific findings that we can share and talk about and celebrate so that would be one thing the second thing is that we have managed to harness big data in new ways so this sort of population data these data banks and that we've managed to somehow square the circle between privacy and open science and, and uh, control and ownership by the people whose data it is. Mm -hmm. And then the third is that we have a sort of new narrative around mental health, which is around how, around this next generation of, of treatments and approaches that allows us to learn from our mistakes and allows us to learn new things and doesn't mean that we are stuck in having to sort of defend everything we've done Mm. or uh, and that that stigma has become such a thing of the past it's become a sort of non-issue in a sense so th those would be my hopes and wishes for the next 10 years wow that's quite that's quite a wish list I, and but I, <laughs> but it feels possible you know you're in yeah you've got such an incredible opportunity I think and you are so amazing at making things happen so yeah I have well I think my closing thought would be that we need collaborators that that I can't do this alone, Welcome can't do this alone, none of us can do this alone, we need collaborators both in the UK and globally. Anyone that's excited by this, join us, join us on this journey. We're trying to be as open as we can. I'm following your lead on trying to be on Twitter, trying to be on uh, LinkedIn, blogging. Uh, so, you know, really try, we, we're open to engagement with people. We also have within Welcome a whole open funding schemes for researchers who come with your great ideas, share them with us, uh, we're trying to simplify our scheme so it should be easier and simpler, but mental health is absolutely front and centre. So please uh, look at us. Don't think we're for someone else. We're for everyone. Come and look and see if there is a way that we can, our funds can help you create a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to make one more more closing thought. Um, just uh, normally I leave people to do whatever they they want, but I'm particularly interested um, in just hearing a few thoughts for you from you on what it is like to be um, a female leader within mental health um, and how, you know, there are lots of really promising um, young women out there who might like to one day, you know, have the chance to change the world uh, like you're doing and what advice would you you give to people like that as I've gone on in my career my eyes have got more and more open to the challenges and exclusions not just of gender but of race and ethnicity and I would say there are many intersectionalities that that limit people's opportunities and I feel deeply committed to try and make sure that we can take this forward in a positive way um, so what I would say to people who feel that they are, are not in the entitled group, whether by virtue of gender or race or, or other um, characteristics, find, find mentors and supporters who can guide you through some of the norms and uh, ways that power is, is held. Think carefully about those issues and find peers and mentors who you can talk to about that so that you can be mindful yourself about how to negotiate the very real uh, power dynamics that exist in our structures.